All right, everybody. So today we have on the podcast, Brian Whitaker. How are you doing, man? I'm good. How are you? Doing well. So one of the things that's really cool about this podcast is, you know, at first it was like, okay, like I got to make sure I have like the right guest on and everything. And like the first few, I was, you know, it was a little different for me. And as I've done it more and more, one of the cool things about it is that it just gives me this opportunity to talk to people in two different instances. One is people like you, where it's like I saw you and your name when I really got started lifting a long time ago. Um, and then also just people where, you know, online you might be talking to people. And in general, it, like let's say you're on Instagram, it's just a quick back and forth. And now it kind of gives me the opportunity to say, well, hey, let's like just have a real conversation. Let's have you on the podcast and really talk. Um, and so I actually saw you as a recommended friend on Facebook. I guess we just have enough mutual contacts. And I think my first kind of introduction to you was I must have still been in high school. And does the name um, Mighty Stu from T Nation <laughs> sound familiar to you? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So I was back on like the T Nation forums and I have mixed feelings about like T Nation in general. But I remember him saying, I remember when he was like not, he had never competed. He was doing his first competition and he said that he was in contact with you. And I was like, oh man, how'd you get in contact with Brian Whitaker? Because like you were kind of known as like this natural pro who just looked freaky, he got super lean. And at the time, I, I remember there was a couple of pictures I'll, I'll post up here. There was a couple of like, I guess, classic pictures of you where I think you, you only competed in like the 160s maybe, is that right? Yeah, that's about right. I've been there about pretty much my whole career. <laughs> yeah, and, and like, but I'd see, you know, these pictures, and obviously, in part, bodybuilding's an illusion, and you just look huge, you look awesome, and I was like, this guy is so damn lean, like, it's just, everything popped, and I remember uh, this guy, Stu, I don't even know Stu's last name, I literally still know him as, like, the mighty Stu on Teen Nation. <laughs> I think that thread is still up there, like, his first prep and everything, and I don't know how involved you were with him, but that was probably like one of the first times I really saw people like interacting with you. So can, for people who don't know you, what is some of your bodybuilding and lifting history? Yeah, sure. So you're, you're making me feel old here, Dave, saying <laughs> you were going to high school and you, which, which I am pretty old now. So, you know, I got my start in natural bodybuilding in kind of the early 2000s. And I was in graduate school at the time. I went to Virginia Tech for graduate school and you know, started training there. And there were some, some lifters at the gym. And so my first actual contest was just a non-sanctioned little Mr. Virginia Tech with like five total bodybuilders in it. And so that was in 2003. And I kind of caught the bug from there. And I, you know, uh, did a couple, well, one more show in 2004. And then 2005, I got pretty serious about it. I started competing in, you know, tested organizations, all the, all the main ones that I won. I ended up winning like four pro cards in 2005, you know, all the different organizations that there are. And then I started competing as a pro in 2006. And so from there, uh, you know, starting in 2006, you know, I competed at a pretty high level. And really my goal at that point was to win WNBF Worlds. And so I set out on a mission from really 2006. And it took me, uh, you know, almost a decade to accomplish my goal. And I finally did that in 2015. You know, I won the WNBF Worlds uh, lightweight title uh, many times over the years, but I never could win the overall. Wow. So I won that title in 2007, and then again in 2008, and then again in 2010, and every time I would lose the overall. And so every year, which is like back to the drawing board, Yeah, uh, I, I basically trained a full year for that one contest, uh, because back then you could only compete in the WNBF, you couldn't kind of switch over. Oh, really? So yeah, so thankfully they changed that rule. You know, I had a, I had a pretty good um, run in, in 2013, I thought that might be my year, I ended up losing the overall by one vote in 2013. Oh, and then I came back in 2015, and I, I think I'm still the only person who's won both the Yorton and WNBF Worlds overall in the same year. So okay. that's my, my little claim to fame. I'm also, you know, one of the few lightweights that's been able to do it. So that's me in, in a nutshell. You know, I think I have like six or seven, you know, uh, class wins at the at the WNBF World Championship level. You know, I won the Yorton, um, and those are that was my last time stepping on stage was 2015. So. I never have officially retired. Um, I've had some, what we can talk about, you know, what I've been up to since then. Yeah. Uh, but there's still part of me that says, hey, maybe you can get back there and do it. But on the other side, you know, that's a pretty good way to, to, to end a career. Sure. That's it goes to, to, you know, finally accomplish what I really wanted to do. Right. So how old are you now? I'm 44, man. I just turned 44 a couple months ago. So, I mean, I'm still training. You know, I, I'm, I'm really happy with where I am right now. It's probably one of the strongest I've ever been in my life. Right. Um, it took me a while to get back here, um, but uh, I'm, you know, I feel good. I feel like my physique is is pretty comparable to where it was back in the, my heyday. So yeah, never, 
You never know. Yeah, that's awesome, man. <laughs> yeah, so, and just for reference, so you said you competed, I think, around, like, 160, and you're, what, 5'9"-ish? Yeah, I'm about 5'9". Um, okay. I had some surgeries that I was hoping would make me a little bit taller. They actually went <laughs> and they actually broke my leg and put a little wedge in there to, to correct some bow leg. And, but uh, I was hoping I'd add, like, a you know, half inch or quarter inch, but I'm still around 5'9". <laughs> okay. <laughs> anyway. um, and, you know, do you remember, you said you went pro in 2006, right? And then you won the uh, WNBF, the overall, in 2015. Yeah. Do you remember your weight before and after? Question. So, honestly, in 2015, uh, well, so short answer is when I turned pro in 2000, it was actually 2005 when I won my pro card, I was probably, you know, 163 ish on okay. stage. And on stage for my last WNBF Worlds, I was honestly probably a few pounds lighter than that. Yeah, uh, yeah I was probably like 161, something like that. That's why I asked. Cause so, I, yeah, and, but the physiques were completely different. I mean, if right. you look at the, you know, when I won my pro card versus when I won the, the world championship, and it's just, you know, it's really night and day in terms of conditioning. And, you know, that's, we natties don't gain five, right. 10 pounds of muscle right. in over a decade. Yeah. Um, it's, you know, when you're at the, when you're kind of already at the end of your diminishing marginal returns there. And so, there's only certain things you can do. You know, I was, I was always big on tweaking poses to get the most out of them. I was big on, you know, making sure uh, every small aspect of competition was, was uh, taken care of. And so that was right. something, I, you know, I would never come in off. I was always trying to be the leanest guy on the show. And when you're 160 pounds, you have to be the leanest guy on the right, show. Right, right. Well, no, I think that's those are really good points. And that's actually why I asked. I'd actually be curious. Um, it's hard to always, like, Google and, and find the right images. But if you have maybe one from when you first went pro to when you won overall, I'd, be, I'd love to see them. And maybe I could post them up, too, for people to see, like, a side-by-side. -side. Um, but I think just in general, like, if you, you know, Eric Helms, he competed lighter and lighter, I, I, if I'm remembering correctly, because he came in leaner. And his off-season weight was lighter and lighter because he didn't get as out of shape in the off-season. And I, you know, I didn't know the weights that before you said them there, but I had a suspicion that that was about what would have happened because I think as a natural, a lot of your improvement comes, you know, after you've been lifting maybe ten plus years, a lot of your improvement comes from getting leaner and leaner. And I, I think it was actually it's interesting to me that you continue to do better and better and then you did your best in 2015 because something I've heard a lot of natural bodybuilders say is that the competition has gotten more and more fierce over the years and I've heard people who said that yes they went pro maybe in 05 or 06 or whatever that they didn't think that if they competed now that they would go pro I've heard a few people say that so obviously you were able to still improve though yeah, it's way more competitive than what when it was when I turned pro. And I still I say the same thing to people is, you know, when I turned pro back in 05, there was maybe, you know, two or three pretty good guys at each show. Mm -hmm. Now there's like, you know, ten or fifteen really good guys and, and most shows and most of them are coming with pretty top notch conditioning. And so yeah. when I turned pro, I I certainly wasn't at the elite level conditioning. Um, I really didn't hit that until, you know, a couple of years later, I don't think. Um, but now it seems like I mean, it's really honestly because of guys like you. There's so much more information out there now that trying to help people um, right. you know, get into elite shape. And so I would point out, you know, if you go to my website, it's just brownwhitaker.net. There's a there is a page on there that shows my progress over the years. Okay. So you can actually go back to you know my first show and then when I turned pro and then when I won you know uh, a couple a couple of titles. You can kind of see the progress. And it's it's pretty interesting to see the changes. But you know, yeah. there's, nothing, there's nothing dramatic in terms of. Right uh, size, yeah. <laughs> but you can sure. see well, and things like that. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll make sure to check it out. It's funny actually, um, and this isn't. This is. I think you'll take this in a fine way. But my, I remember like years back talking with a, a natural lifter, a friend of mine, and he was trying to tell me because I was kind of of the view of like, look, man, like once you're at this point, you're just not going to progress that much. And he was showing me like, no, like you know, as a natural, you can still progress for years and years. And I think we were talking about Jeff Alberts and, you know, he was trying to tell me how Jeff competed like 10 pounds heavier. And I said to him, you know, one of the reasons that was, was because he maintained so much more muscle on the way down, which is important. You know, of course that's important, but I was pointing out that it doesn't mean his off season weight, he had gained 10 pounds of muscle. I think one of the things that has come about in recent years is, you know, people implementing refeeds and, and like there's different, you know, ways to go slower when you're dieting down ways to maintain muscle, which is, at the end of the day, on competition day, that's just as important as, as what you built. But I remember there was a picture of before and after of you, and I could see a difference, and I know my friend could see a difference, 
but I remember like showing my mom this these pictures, you know, this like high school me, and she literally didn't believe that they were different pictures. And she's like, Dave, those are the same picture. And I was like, no, mom, look, there's this, this. And I had to like show her that the background was different for her to believe it. <laughs> and I think like in one sense, maybe that's disheartening. But again, it's like, like you said, it's it's not like when it's at that level, you really are looking for those small changes. And I think that's why like one of my big messages is, is always like you have to eventually learn to love the process because those first few years, you can do it for the results. But I think if you're only doing it for the results at the end, you're going to really struggle to find that motivation to continue. Yeah. Well, that's a really good point. One of the things I would I actually gave this talk a couple of times at Lane Norton's camp. So, you know, back when he used to have these kind of VIP camps, I would always take progress pictures as I was dieting down. And so one of my, <laughs> one of the kind of the moments of truth for me was, you know, I would take them in the same place every year. And so, you know, I would be maybe 10, 15 weeks into prep. I would post up the exact same pose from this year versus last year. And I would like, you know, make it transparent and mm. overlay it on the previous on the mm. previous year. And you could see, you know, maybe like a millimeter of growth in the quads or something. Right, right. Yeah, you know I mean? yeah right. <laughs> last year has been worth it. And sometimes you wouldn't see any difference at all. And I'm like, oh geez, I just spun my yeah. wheels for, you know, a, a year. But that's the kind of stuff that we're talking about. You know, in natural bodybuilding, it's gonna be minute changes over time. And it's not something like an everyday person would be like, yeah, he looks the exact same as he did five, 10 years ago. But right, right. You know, at that elite level, there's the little things that we push for. Yeah. And I think that's also the difference between a competitor and somebody who, I, even if you take it seriously, I mean, I take it very seriously, but I don't compete. And so it, it is a little different. And for me, those little things are important, but I, I do try to keep it in the context of like, okay, you know, make this a part of your life, enjoy it. Like, like I've measured my arms, for instance, so many times that I'd like to think it's pretty standardized, like done it, taken it away, done it again. And like I get very, very similar measurements. Same thing with my calipers, waistline. So for me, if I gain an eighth of an inch on my arms, like I, I believe that that's like a real eighth of an inch, you know, and obviously there's other factors that could go in there. And I, I look at my strength levels, you know, is my strength on the major movements, any, you know, improved, et cetera. But I think at this stage, you do have to like look for those little things. Um, or, I mean, and, and I don't ne necessarily think there's anything wrong with the person who says, you know what, I'm not going to take it as seriously. I'm just going to maintain. I just think it's a different mindset. I think people like you and m maybe not now, I, I don't know, but at least up until 2015, you probably would have had a hard time just saying, I'm just going to, even though you knew you could maintain 95% of your physique on two or three workouts a week. I would imagine that somebody like you had a hard time accepting that because you seem like you were very competitive right at that time. So it's just a different mindset. I, I wouldn't say one is necessarily right or wrong. Yeah. And, and that's honestly one thing I'm, I'm, I've been struggling with a little bit after 2015, to be honest, because I was so driven mm -hmm. for so long to accomplish that goal. And you're right. I mean, all season, you know, on the, literally on the flight back from every, every world championships that I, you know, won't lost the overall, I would make a list of, okay, here's what I need to improve on for the next year. And I would start that process literally the day after, you know, a world. And it right. was, I was so driven to accomplish that goal that, you know, now that I've done it, I'm kind of like, okay, you know, do I, do I still have that drive? Right. And honestly, for the last couple of years, it's the answer is no. Um, I still train, but yeah. I'm not willing to push myself to that low level of body fat and, you know, suffer through the, the mental anguish that goes with it yeah sure so, you know, i've got a, i've got a growing family and i've been able to dedicate you know more time to them and that's been nice and everything but i still think that fire might be might be down in there somewhere we'll see yeah yeah i mean it's a good talking point that i i do often bring up with people who've been lifting for a long time because it's something that i even kind of struggle with where you know i got started when i was 12 so i'm 29 now and for the first probably 14 to 15 years it was just like everything to me so when i was kind of forced to take a step back I mean, it was really hard mentally. And it's something I still, I would say, struggle with where I've accepted it more, but it is hard to just to not, you know, kill myself at the gym like I used to and, you know, push for that progress. So, I mean, have you found ways that help you kind of deal with that? Yeah, I've actually, you know, again, I'm, I'm, I've been, I think I've been known for this throughout my career is that I'm really big on prioritization. And so to me, I always, always put family number one. Mm -hmm. And so if I got to the point where I was dieting and low energy and feeling miserable, and I would just remind myself, you know, you cannot ever take it out on people around you because once you reach that point, your goals are, you, you flip-flop something there. You yeah. know, at that point, family's no longer one. So I never, ever 
try to sacrifice, you know, for me, it's family first, then my job, because bodybuilding is not a job. All right. Um, and then, you know, you can put something a little bit more, you know, uh, personal or, or something that you're, you're trying to accomplish on your own. And that's to me was, was I took bodybuilding very seriously, yeah. but it was always third. You know, I, I, for my job, I had to travel and sometimes you have to, you know, use a hotel gym and you have to, you know, pack four, meal, four days worth of meals in your little carry on. And so it was, you know, very challenging, but the other things came first, right? I had yeah. to do my job. I had to, you know, present at conferences and all that kind of stuff. And um, so it, to me, just having a clear delineation of what was first, what was second, and then kind of fitting bodybuilding in those parameters was was big for me. And, you yeah. know, actually, there's something in, I'm, uh, I teach economics, and we actually teach something called constrained optimization. So it's not just, you know, optimizing bodybuilding without any other constraints. It's realizing that, mm. hey, you have these constraints, you need to commit this much to your family, this much to your job. And within those constraints, now you can optimize bodybuilding. And so it's like, you know, again, maybe training four days a week instead of six and, right. and, and that kind of thing. So, you know, I, I've, I've been pretty big at that my, throughout my whole career. It's kind of realizing that, like you said, this should be part of your life, not the dominant force of your life. It should be something that helps you in, in other aspects. And, and I think uh, I've been able to, to accomplish that throughout my career. And it's something I'm, I'm kind of proud of is that I, you know, I still don't think to this day that my wife really understands how difficult it is to diet down. And right. To, that you she, don't show it. Yeah. She just kind of thinks that, oh, he eats different food and, you know, gets, yeah. gets skinny. <laughs> um, and so uh, I, I don't want people to, you know, to say, oh, he's trying to diet and avoid him. And, you know, right. Uh, right. I, I want it to be just something that, you know, it's kind of an add on to what to my everyday life. So you were always working when you were competing. Oh, yeah. 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 Uh, in fact, you know, I was, you know, when I got started, so I started my job here at Oklahoma State right around the time that I turned pro. I turned pro in 05 and I started here in 06. So I was doing my first pro show. And of course, you know, in, in academia, you're starting off, you know, in a tenure track position, but there's no guarantee you're going to make tenure. And so I was working, right. you know, pretty yeah. serious, like 10, 12 hours a day. I would go to gym late at night. And, you know, I just had to make sure, you know, you get your publications, make presentations, all this kind of stuff. So I was putting in a lot of hours, you know, before, and that was, you know, on the job and then kind of doing the, the bodybuilding thing, like I said, as an afterthought to that. Yeah. So that was, that was pretty, <laughs> pretty intense time. Once you get tenure, you know, now I can go to the gym in the middle of the day and, and kind of scroll right, my, right. Script my life a little bit, a little bit differently. Uh, but that was pretty, you know, you had to, you definitely had to work the pro organization angle there. Do you use the university gym you're at? Uh, typically, for the past 14, 15 years, I have. But now, you know, in the, during this COVID time, um, yeah. it's, it's a little because the actually here in Stillwater, we were a little bit of a hot spot the past uh, couple months, and mm -hmm. so there's a, a local gym that I've been using, I'm a little bit more comfortable there right now. Okay. Um, so, but for the you know for the past decade plus, it's just the university gym. Yeah. Yeah, I feel like every school there's at least like one or two like unusually jacked professors. You know. <laughs> <laughs> the thing about me, man, I don't you know I don't. I don't own a tank top. I don't own a sleeveless shirt. So you 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 probably wouldn't know. Yeah. <laughs> in the gym, you just, I just look like a normal dude. Right, um, right. Some people kind of you know to come talk to me about it. They they kind of realize who I am, but I don't ever you know just like right bodybuilder sure. and, and try to show off. That's a big pet peeve of mine. Uh, How much do you get up to it weight wise in the off season? And you know, in the past, my rule of thumb was. Um, I would be some, you know, like I said, my contest weight was somewhere in the low 160s, 165 at a max, and I would get up to 190, 195. Right. Um, here more recently, I've been staying leaner. I feel a little bit better now. Um, honestly, at, you know, 190, 195, I still had a semblance of abs, uh, mm -hmm. but they were it was pretty fuzzy <laughs> and not didn't look so great. And I'm not convinced that I was that that was an optimal way to go about making making progress over the years. I still I feel pretty good where I am now. I'm probably sitting at you know maybe 170 yeah. um and oh, uh wow. so you're really uh, not so I'm, I'm pretty, yeah so i'm i'm fairly you know lean right now um and my strength is good man you know i'm still i'm, I'm pretty happy with where it is i feel like i've uh, i'm still making reasonable progress in terms of you know, the main lifts and, and on a physique uh, level as well so yeah i remember you had a pretty beastly deadlift so what were some of your top numbers for the big movements so yeah, Lane and uh, Lane actually came to to here to Stillwater. This has been probably five or six years ago, and we had a we had a three times body weight for reps challenge. So I think you can find that on YouTube. My, my reps weren't so great, but uh, that was a that was a fun contest. So um, you know, even right now, you know, I'm pulling 
three, uh, that was back when I was pulling sumo. I don't pull sumo anymore. I pull conventional. So even now, you know, I'm pulling three times body weight for five or six reps without without too mm-hmm. much of a problem. So that's, you know, awesome. that's pretty good for me. Uh, squats, uh, I'm probably mid 400 to this point for a one rep max, which is which is decent. And then I've been I've always been a terrible bencher. So back yeah. in you know, when I was young like you, I I think I reached I got over three plates at one point, but now I'm. You know, I'm, I'm I'm working with two plates, and that's about it. So yeah. those are those are probably my bad. I'm not a power lifter, but I sure. like being heavy. Um, I'm actually working. I just started working with with Mike Zordos. Uh, I don't know if you okay. did, but yeah. I, he, he helped me through my when I was competing at Worlds the last couple times, and did a great job. And I just started with him uh, a couple weeks ago. He's a really great programmer, and, and you know, he realizes that I'm not training for powerlifting. I'm training for you know, kind of a, a physique oriented goals, and he's he's got some pretty cool schemes that I like to. That's Interesting. Right. So he was doing your training when you were competing for bodybuilding? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, okay. so he did my programming in 2013 when I looked, I think I looked really good that year, and in 2015 as well. And so, okay. like, he's obviously he's kind of more known for the, the research side and the right, right side, but he's a good friend of mine, and, uh, and I think he's a really cool person and, and just uh, reached out to me and said, hey, if you're interested in working with me, I'm happy to do that. And I was like, heck yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, it's funny, man. Like talking to you, I like have this nostalgia for that period of my life, like when I was first kind of introduced to things. Because back then, I mean, it, it's changed so much since I got started. So, like when I think of like me in high school, do you know Tom Venuto? Name rings a bell. So he was one of the guys. There was like this is when like ebooks were a big thing, and so like there was this guy Mark David who put together an ebook of like a lot of other people, and Tom Venuto was like thirty day growth spurt, which. The, the ebook itself was kind of gimmicky, like, you know, how could you get the best results in 30 days, which is obviously, you know, obviously rushed. But Tom Venuto had that. And then he has um, Burn the Fat, Feed the Muscle is like yeah. his book that he's well known for. So anyway, he was a competitive natural bodybuilder. And he, I mean, very impressive physique. And I remember just like reading his stuff, just soaking it up. Um, before him, it was like Body for Life by Bill Phillips right. and all that stuff. But that's when it's like, there is a sense of freedom now that you realize, or at least a lot of people talk about if it fits your macros and not necessarily needing to have like a hundred percent strict diet all the time, not necessarily needing to eat six to eight meals a day, all of those things. And in terms of incorporating it into my life, that has been very helpful, you know, not having to like necessarily be a slave to it, but there was something to be said for that kind of like warrior attitude that like, again, when you're new to this and you're really motivated, it was like, yes, like, I am going to bring my Tupperware, like even in high school, I remember going into the bathroom, like chugging a shake between <laughs> classes because like, that's just what I did and bringing my Tupperware everywhere. And, you know, you talked about how you had a job and while you had this job, you were really like competitive. And I prided myself on that, like, again, just being like so unbelievably strict. So it's just kind of funny how it's changed now. So I think obviously there's kind of like Instagram culture and people almost take pride in how much junk they can eat, you know, rather than the other way around and how they can look good doing that. Um, a lot of people do see bodybuilding as like their job and like, they think like they can't have a job. I and mean, that's more in like the, uh, I guess enhanced side, but, but even some naturals I know where it's like, they're going to make this their whole life. And it's just, it's really interesting how even just in 10 years, it's shifted so much, you know? Yeah, that's very true. And, you know, I will say upfront that when I competed, I, controlled everything that I ate you know I knew exactly what it was and for the most part I did bring Tupperwares everywhere you know I still yeah. know people when I was kind of making my entry into academia they were like oh that's the guy who brings his Tupperware to conferences right so right <laughs> that kind of thing um so I'm still pretty big on that uh you know I, I definitely my my eating is a lot uh you know messier I guess you could say or or I-F-Y-M in the in the off season um but you know if I were to go back competing I'm, I'm still I guess kind of in the in the clean eating uh, yeah. bandwagon where um, you know I know what works for me at this point and uh, I don't know that I would really go away from it to, to, right, to right. get more well. to shape. Yeah. So when you diet down, and I know this has actually kind of been a debate recently, where um, there's a guy I talked to with the podcast Abel Chabai, and we were talking about refeeds. He had Menno Henselman on and Lyle McDonald to talk about refeeds, and for me. I was very surprised that he did not incorporate them and Menno doesn't really incorporate them because growing up, it was just that like everybody did it, you know, from body for life. It was the one cheat day per week, um, carb cycling. I mean, there was always some form of refeeds incorporated. So recently hearing about some people not doing it at all, I was actually pretty surprised. So what is your opinion there as far as when dieting down? 
Yeah, so I mean, first thing I should say is for the most part during my career, I did my own diet. Um, I did work with Lane a little bit for the you know the last couple of years that I was competing. But generally speaking, I'm huge on carb cycling and not necessarily refeeds. So I would you know the I basically kept my protein and fats consistent throughout the diet. The only thing I would alter was the, the amount of carbs I would take in, and you know just like a traditional carb cycling approach, if you're training something that requires a lot of intensity, legs or back, you bump the carbs up. If you have an off day or just some lower intensity day carbs go down. So that was basically the way it worked for me. And, and, you know, I, you know, I had long, uh, diet preps, you know, I mm-hmm. diet basically for 26 weeks each time that I, that I got uh, into, into contest shape. And so I didn't, you know, I never really had a plan or quote unquote refeed that wasn't outside of just a normal carb cycling boundary. Yeah. Um, so yeah, you know, I, I don't know. Um, I get, when you're doing it as long as I can, as I have been, you're, you're pretty in tune with your body and you know what you respond well to. And so there were days, you know, where it was supposed to be a low carb day and, you know, typically you would just suffer through it. But sometimes you were like, okay, I, my, I really do need a little bit higher yeah. carbs just to, just to, because I'm, I feel like I'm you know, flattened out over the last three or four days or whatever. Right. So, you know, I'd like to think that I'm in tune enough with my own physique at this point to, to realize when that happens and, and know that yeah it's okay to have another you know half cup of oats this day or whatever right so, which can be hard to be objective i mean I'm, I'm sure again you've done it so many times but i think the deeper you get into a diet the more your brain starts to tell you like yeah yeah, yeah i think you need this one right <laughs> maybe you need some pancakes today right right well that's a good point because another thing i'm you know i've been blessed with is i have a lot of friends that that you know compete on our elite level uh competitors so you know guys like lane and guys like doug miller and my friend kurt widener you know they've been doing this for even longer than I have. And so I'm always, you know, kind of sending them pictures and being like, okay, you know, this is me eight weeks out. What do you think? Is should I, here's my plan. Should I bump up the carbs? Should I uh, do more cardio or whatever? It's that's been yeah. a nice kind of sound sure. for me. Is Doug Miller as absurd looking in person as he is in pictures? Yes. Yes. <laughs> um, you know, he's, he's amazing, man. He's, you know, I've always said he kind of redefined what is, is possible in natural bodybuilding. And I still believe that. I still think he's the best natty of all time. Uh, he's just an awesome person and uh, just an amazing bodybuilder. So you know, I've got the, the core shirt on right now. He's, you know, I'm lucky to be a, a sponsored athlete through them. And he's ridiculous. You know, I've never, I've trained with some of the best, you know, in natural bodybuilding. And he's just amazing to train with and to watch in the gym. Um, he has a true passion for this. And you can tell uh, yeah. he's a smart guy. You know, he's not, he's not a, He's not one of the typical meathead. He's he knows, you know, the the biochemics behind everything that he's that he's uh, promoting, and, and uh, you know, Core's a, a great company, and he's really had a lot of success with them. And like I said, an amazing person and an incredible natural bodybuilder. Was he like freaky in high school too? Do you know? So I didn't know him in high school. I don't think. Uh, you know, the first time I, I even emailed Doug was like back in probably about the time I got serious about it, like oh four or five. He was just kind of coming up, and you can look at some of his early picks. And that when he first started competing, he was a you know he was a good competitor, but not yeah. and not <laughs> you wouldn't have known what he would go on to become. Right. But I mean, the thing about Doug is he optimizes everything. Like as soon as he's done with the training, you know he'll have his he has his shake ready to go. He takes it like immediately after training. He has another meal planned. You know, x number of uh, minutes hours after that, he's got a supplementation down to a you know. A, the, the minutia. It's right. just when you do that for decades on end, you can kind of see how, I mean, I, I tried to do that, but I don't hit every, you know, minutia right. in the season like he does. Um, so it's, it's, it's a, it's pretty impressive to see him in action and kind of see how he organizes everything throughout his, his uh, career. And, you know, like, like me, he's got a family and he's got multiple businesses. It's a, it's pretty, pretty cool to watch in person. Yeah, I think if I think of like the two natural competitors that have had the most controversy as far as like their natty status, it's Doug Miller and Lane Norton, as far as <laughs> what comes to my mind. So, and I mean, I get it because like I, I've never met either of them. Uh, I've talked to Lane a handful of times and they're both, I mean, I think they both compete in like the 190s. Is that right? Yeah, um, so that's probably about right. I think Lane may have been a little bit heavier. I mean, he last competed in like 2010, I think. Yeah, so. it's been a long time. So he's yeah. probably right around, right around 200 maybe. Um, and actually, so I, you know, haven't seen Lane on stage. My, my, my friend, was the last show Lane competed, I think it was his last show. My friend was a lightweight and beat him in the overall. And really? It was, it was deserved. I mean, he was, he was, you know, my, my buddy was really good. 
Um, but, uh, you know, I certainly, I completely believe Lane's natty, and I completely believe Doug is natty. Uh, I know there's people out there that are saying, no way, you can't get to that level naturally. But when you see these guys work and realize how long they've been at it and the amount of effort they put into it, uh, to me, it's completely, it's completely believable. Yeah. I think this is where I feel like the need to state what we know is obvious, but maybe just for people listening, like obviously the genetic factors here, because uh, it's one of those things where I definitely on this podcast talk a lot about genetics and it's not part of it is because of the population I'm talking to. And the reason being like, so I think most of the listeners are somewhat serious in this endeavor. And so if I was talking to like general population, I would almost never be like, you know, it's so much about your genetics because I think the average person really needs to probably put more effort into it, right? If you just look like the average American, almost all of them could dramatically improve with just more effort. I think when you're looking at somebody who, like the difference between you and Lane, for instance, right? Those 30 pounds is largely genetic, right? I mean, you've worked your ass off for years and years and years. You're a great example of somebody who's done 99% of things correctly. So you know that I know that Lane knows that I just I don't want people to hear that like you know it's just because of his hard work it's it's that but that's not the difference of 30 pounds of muscle between you and Lane you know I always kind of get irked when people say oh that Whitaker guy is only like 160 you know he has he doesn't try very hard I'm like I'm deadlifting you know three times my body weight for you know six seven reps I'm squatting in the mid 400s what I mean what else do you want me to do I've, I've tried. right pushing myself as hard as I can. There's, I'm just not going to be a 180 pound bodybuilder. There, right, I mean, it's right. just not in my cards. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I completely, I completely get what you're saying. And by the way, I, you know, I've beaten plenty of good bodybuilders who are 190, 200 pounds. I'm sure. That's yeah. one of the things I'm, you know, I love about natural bodybuilding is, you know, the, the littler guys, it's not who's bigger, it's who's better. And yeah. so, you know, I'm, I'd like to think I could pull my own against, against Lane and, and even Doug. Uh, I yeah. think probably, probably uh, you know end up beating me but he's i like to think i could i could hold my own against uh, pretty much anybody in the natural in the natural world uh just I mean, because so of what i've seen of you yeah uh, it's it's all about having the, the complete physique and i've put a lot of effort into being a complete bodybuilder yeah i mean at some point when you look at like like you said you, you know your lifts and everything like there's only so much you can do i'm sure as somebody so i never had like a great response especially from a uh like a size standpoint you know, so I'm I'm six one. I have a six four arm span. So I have these long limbs, oh which are great for athletics. Terrible for bodybuilding. <laughs> um, you know, I've got the biggest my arms ever got to was maybe like seventeen and a quarter. Not lean. When lean, maybe like sixteen and a quarter. But I have friends with fifteen inch arms who just like dominate me. You know, but when I was twenty, I was one seventy deadlifting about five ten, so about triple body weight. Um, I was never like super strong on bench, but I was inclining 265 for five. Like there were numbers where it's like, look, guys, like I'm doing what I can. I've hit the numbers, but it just doesn't <laughs> it doesn't show as much, you know, and at some point um, and, you know, not even just in terms of muscle mass, but like we were saying, muscle shape, structure, so much of that is genetics and, and you do what you can with it. And I think, like you said, you might be 160, 165, but from your pictures, I mean, I'm sure you could smoke a lot of heavier guys. Yeah, I mean, that's one thing I'm. I'm really proud of is that I did beat a lot of guys that were, you know, significantly bigger, 20, 30 pounds more on, had more, you know, that much more muscle than me, but you know, they didn't get as lean as, as I did. They didn't put as much effort into, I mean, uh, you know, a big part of bodybuilding is showcasing your physique and I was mm-hmm. to get every single pose optimizing right. what I had, you know, I have, you know, some strong points in my physique and some weak points. And so it's all about, you know, highlighting the, the strong points and minimizing the weak points. And I spent a lot of, put a lot of time into that. Um, you know, I would, I, I pose basically every day, you know, leading up to probably, probably starting at, you know, 10, 12 weeks out and, and really spending a lot of time just focusing on, you know, what it was that, that I could present to the judges and, and make, and make up for that 20, 30 pounds. I think that's something that, I, you know, oftentimes goes, goes uh, unacknowledged in, in the yeah. body. Um, yeah, I think a lot of people don't talk about posing that much. And I think in part because almost everybody who like listens to this podcast or reads about this stuff is interested in gaining muscle, losing fat, etc. Not everybody wants to compete, but if you are going to compete or even just, you know, just pose, take pictures, that posing is huge. I mean, just like, you know, being able to push your hamstring up against the other leg in the right way and, and put your triceps down. I mean, it's just I've seen posing make dramatic differences. And obviously at that level where, you know, if you're maybe gained 
only half a pound of muscle or maybe didn't get in in muscle while you came in a little bit leaner, that posing can make such a big difference. But I, you're right. I don't hear it talked about that much. Yeah, I think it's a, you know, a really valid point at the elite levels of, of natural bodybuilding. You know, I can think of a couple guys that were had absolutely amazing genetics for, for natural bodybuilding, but never really presented it as well as they, as they maybe could have. And so, um, you know, just leaving the door open a little bit like that, I have to take advantage of every little thing I can. And so for me, yeah. that was something I, you know, like I said, I tried to uh, do little tweaks on, on poses, like you're saying, smash the hamstring, you know, push the chest out, um, you know, change the way you, you hit a pose to, for me, I've always had terrible calves, so I try to hide the, the fact that I don't have very good calves. Yeah, I know that feel, man. <laughs> I think like, that gets back to genetics, like you said, but, um, you know, minimize or maximize the things that I do have that are, that are, um, that are strong points. So, you know, I have a pretty small waist. Um, I try to show off uh, my, my taper and my conditioning and every pose and that kind of stuff. So. Yeah. Do you know what your waist measures by the time you're in contest condition? <laughs> I, it's been a long time since I measured. I, so the la I think I measured it at one point when I was in shape, and it was it was under 28 inches. So it's somewhere in that range. Yeah. I mean, it's pretty. You know, I don't. I never had a huge chest or you know huge sweeping quads, but they look okay because my waist is so small. <laughs> yeah. Now a small waist is like like that's like one thing I wish I could like. No, I mean, there's other weak points I have, but that small waist, man, it, it's just like such a difference. Like my. I guess my best pose would be like maybe like a side tricep where I can kind of just like hide the waist, you know, uh, but I'll do like a front double by and it's like up here looks good. And then down here, I'm like, can we just block this? Out? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, what's it going to ask you? Oh, so when you look at your progress over, you know, again, I think that 2006, 2015 period is a good gauge there because you didn't maybe put on a ton of muscle. I mean, I imagine you put on some muscle in addition to losing fat. Do you think most of that progress is a matter of doing the same thing for, you know, year after year after year? Or do you think, were there routines, nutritional practices, things that you implemented that you thought really helped? Yeah, I've tried just about every split there is over the, <laughs> over the you know, uh, 20 plus years that I've been training. And I do feel like, you know, for a long time, I was on a, I was on a bro split for you know, a long time. I would train arms one day and chest one day. And that's kind of the way that I came up before the before all this great information was out there. And so there were times when I felt like I, when I changed, you know, kind of went away from that, that I really did start making good progress. And one I can point to in particular is, you know, when I first started getting serious about deadlifting multiple times a week, squatting multiple times a week, um, I think I, I can really attribute some good, uh, you know, gains in terms of quad and hamstring size and, and back size to those times when I would, you know, have, you know, kind of the, the traditional, when you think about uh, the, the linear, the periodized training, um, yeah. DUP approach from, from Zordos, you know, have one day where you're more focused on eight to 10 reps. And then the next day where you're more focused on, you know, four to six reps with the, with those main exercises. Right. You know, I think I, I had a, a really good, I think it was probably in the, you know, if you look at the, those progress picks, you can probably see a difference in my quads sometime around, you know, 2009, 2010. And okay. so that was when I first started you know, squatting multiple times a week. I was working in front squats for the first time, you know, like serious, heavy front squats. And so I really think I responded pretty well to those. Um, and that's something, you know, I'm still pretty big on is, is squatting multiple times a week, deadlifting multiple times a week. Um, and I think, but, you know, overall, you, I think it's that, 10 plus years of constant training and constant yeah. nutrition and the nutrition's big too, you know, even now, you know, I'm, I'm basically eating very healthy, very optimal for growth pretty much year round. Yeah. Um, and I think that's, you got to do that for, like you said, five, 10 years before you're going to kind of hit that plateau, I think. Yeah. Yeah. So how old were you when you got started? Like, let's so see. my first show I think was, let's see, uh, I think I was right around 26 somewhere in there. So kind of mid, mid twenties is when I first did my first show. And I, um, maybe it's a little bit older than that, 28 maybe. Uh, because I ended up, I know that I won, I won, uh, worlds overall at 39. So that okay. was, that was, you know, like I said, it was about a decade in between. Well, that's probably about right. 26 to, to 39 between first okay. show and world title. Um, as far as like lifting. Yeah. Oh, for, so lifting, you know, I've been training, I started in, like most people, you know, kind of a sophomore year of high school. So okay. that was, uh, let's see, I probably had, I probably had a decade or so before I tried bodybuilding, you uh -huh. know, 
10 to 12 years before uh, before giving it a shot. And then that was just because I didn't, you know, there, there wasn't much internet back then. We didn't know. Yeah, like, I was gonna say back then, like I didn't, I didn't know anybody. I mean, now it's like, it, as you said, it's so prevalent. And I think social media has, has had a pretty big influence on that. I mean, Instagram is very, you know, aesthetic oriented, you right. know, and, and I think that has actually led to the popularity of it. There's like, you know, YouTube channels with million followers and, and subscribers who talk almost strictly about bodybuilding. I mean, it's really changed a lot before it was completely niche. And now, like, I feel like the average person even knows at least people on Instagram who are competing, you know, and I don't think anybody knew like 10 years ago, people like that. So it, it is interesting. I don't know if you have much of a, a social media presence yourself. I mean, I, I don't think you have too big of one, right? It's kind of funny because that's that's actually something I'm known for is like, I basically don't do social media. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, um, you know, I have an Instagram account, but I have zero picture. I've never posted anything to it. It's kind of funny because I have, you know, I think I have at least a thousand followers and I've never really? posted any pictures at all. They're just so. waiting, man. They're waiting yeah, for your comeback. Guess, you know, I, yeah, I try to do some stuff on Facebook and that's actually how, you know, we connected uh, right. just because core sponsors me and I want to show support for core and you know I, I do have a, a little bit of name recognition in terms of, of natural bodybuilding but mm -hmm. I generally don't don't like social media because I feel like it's just all bragging it's just all people bragging and I don't like yeah. bragging um, but you know there's something to be said for what you said for what you mentioned um, you know I, I'm actually uh, friends with Jeff Nipper who's done an amazing mm -hmm. job with his YouTube channel I mean that's I think it's what how he does this that's how yeah. makes income now is yeah he really does a great job with those videos um, so, you know, when I first heard him say, you know, I want to be a YouTube content creator, I was kind of like, <laughs> but hey, you know, he's getting like a million views on his, on his videos. Oh yeah, it's crazy. Uh, an outstanding job. So, um, yeah, I'm definitely not a, a social media um, uh, oriented person. I'm much more reserved in nature. I don't like putting myself out there. I'm, I'm one of those people who just likes to, to put the work in and then show up on contest day. Um, but I do... You know, I, I think you're right that social media has played a large role in more exposure for the sport and, and probably getting people into it. Uh, but I'm just not, that's just not me as to not you. There and, and yeah, it's funny when, on a daily basis. I, when I was saying before, like talking to you kind of brings back some nostalgia and you said like you don't own cutoffs, right, or anything like <laughs> that. And so from like, again, probably like 13 to I want to say like 20, because I read stuff like by people like you and, and Tom Venuto and all that, it was all about like that you stay humble about it. So I, I never had a cutoff ever. And when I was a freshman in college, I remember seeing these two guys and they were both skinnier than me and they both had cutoffs, like clearly pretty new to lifting. I just remember like literally having the thought of like, wow, like they're such douches. <laughs> and of course, you know, the next year I see them getting a lot bigger. I met them and actually they're now like two of my closest friends, <laughs> but they unfortunately got me into being a douche myself. And so I have definitely, I have plenty of cutoffs, you know, I don't have any super deep tees, you know, like my nipples pointing out or anything like that, which they definitely did wear. But I, uh, I, I'm like a hybrid, I guess, you know, maybe a cutoff here on arm day, you know, I, I keep it reasonable. That's good. Yeah. No, I mean, one thing I try to, I try to stress is that I certainly don't, judge people you know there's a there's plenty of people in the in the gym uh here at, at osu and, and, and here in stillwater that wear cutoffs and are awesome people yeah uh, but for me it's just not about i don't want to i just don't, try not to put myself out there um you know when i'm in the gym i like to kind of put my head down and go to work and, and sometimes right. if you're wearing a cutoff or a tank top you're going to get questions from people and i'm right. not that I'm against that but i it's i don't want that to interrupt my workouts on a regular basis so i try yeah. to just uh just avoid as much um attention as i can sure yeah no i was also very <laughs> i was very uh like i guess anti-social or, or like anti-conversation in the gym before it's headphones okay I, i'm at work basically i'm like doing my thing um and i'll again i'll admit I, i've kind of lightened up a little bit on that over the years because i've met some of my closest friends at the gym um but again i i can appreciate that that mindset that i think you still probably have that warrior mindset to you so uh, that'd be cool if you have a comeback man i think that'll be cool <laughs> to see bring it back so yeah. with uh it, are you friends with the 3dmj guys at all oh sure sure yeah actually so jeff is uh you know actually he's one of the people i talked to about posing tweaks i mean there's no better poser yeah in the bodybuilding world than jeff alberts um you know like i said even like 2013 2015 i was sending him you know some vids and pictures and be like what can i do in this pose to, to make it i don't think it's right what should i do 
and even for me, you know, I've been around for 10, 15 years. I was at, you know, I've won world championships and he was like, okay, here's what I think you can do. Yeah. And that was, that's what I think is cool about these guys is they're not, you know, overwhelmed by someone asking for advice. They're, 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 they're really helpful. And Alberto is an awesome guy. I think he was actually there when I won in 2015. Oh, really? Um, so he's a, a good friend as well. And, you know, all those guys are, are really cool. Eric, Eric's come up a long way um, in his career. I mean, he's one of the most well-known, you know, researchers yeah. now. So it's, it's kind of fun to watch people progress in their careers. For sure, um, for sure, man. Awesome, man. Well, dude, I really appreciate you taking the time to talk. It's good getting to know you here. Like I said, I, I knew a lot more about you than you knew about me, but it, it's great to be able to talk to people like you, uh, see that you still have some of that fire there. And I know, you, like you said, you're not big on social media, but if people want to learn more about you or find out, you know, maybe reach out, where is the best place to do that? So sure. I mean, you know, I probably I try to post once every couple months on Facebook. I'm not so good at it. Uh, but, you know, I do have the website, brianwhitaker.net, and I do have, you know, there's an email on there, um, and I do try to answer emails. I, I still get a couple emails every every month, and I try to reply to every single email I get from, uh, you know, up-and-coming competitors, people, people uh, you know, kind of the next generation. That's kind of, honestly, that's kind of what I see my role as now, is trying to, you know, help out the, the next generation. Um, I'm trying to support some people here in, in Stillwater that are competing. Some really good competitors have come out of here. Uh, and, and I think I, I have some knowledge to impart on those, on those, on that next generation. Yeah. So I'm happy to, happy to uh, email people, you know, even critique posing and things like that over, over, uh, over uh, either just sending pictures or send YouTube videos and I can suggest some tweets and things like that. So that's the, probably the, you know, uh, email and, and, and uh, Facebook are probably the two optimal ways for me. Very cool, man. All right. Well, thanks again so much. And I'll have links to your website below. Awesome. Thanks, Dave.